So, hi everybody. Hi, Dr. Nick. Uh, okay, so my name is Jared Boone. Uh, I have a small one-person open source hardware business. Uh, I love playing with radios and FPGAs and all sorts of other stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a hardware hacker. And, uh, I, but I, like really, I really like coming to these uh, conferences because I get to spend a whole lot of time with other people who are really smart and love technology. Um, that said, I am not one of you. I'm more someone who just noodles around with stuff in his spare time. But I saw an opportunity. Um, I saw these uh, tire pressure monitors on cars. And I thought, well, these are interesting. I wonder, wonder what the implications of these are. And I, I looked around a little bit. And it turns out they're actually legislated by the US government. Back in uh, the late 90s, there were some uh, tire blowouts, very high, high profile, big media stories about uh, Firestone tires blowing up. And the US Congress, as they do, passed some very vague leg legislation that said, yeah, we need to um, make cars monitor tire pressure so that if something bad happens, the driver knows and they can do something about it. And thus was born, over the course of many more years, uh, the tire pressure monitoring system. Um, it's a standard feature now on all cars sold in the US as of 2008. All of them are required to have it. So any, any new car you see driving around is going to have these tire pressure monitors. Um, as you can imagine, because these tire pressure monitors are attached to the wheels and the wheels spin around, they can't be wired to the car. It's kind of impractical. So they operate wirelessly. Um, and this is an example of a tire pressure monitor right here. Uh, if you go on eBay, there's tons of these things being sold on the open market. Uh, you can just buy some, um, have a look at them. I, I just spent time pulling down eBay images and looking at the, at the photos. Uh, if you examine all the different varieties that you find on eBay, you find common features like 8-bit or uh, sorry, 32-bit identifiers. Um, this is a 32-bit hex number, and they all seem to have 32-bit hex numbers printed on them. Uh, they also usually identify what frequency they operate in. Uh, in this case, 315 megahertz. There are also a bunch that operate in 433. Um, it turns out that it, it seems like uh, US and Japanese cars operate in 315, and European cars operate in, at, on 433. They all have FCC IDs because they all intentionally emit uh, radio signals. And the great thing about FCC IDs, uh, as anyone who's taken Mike Osman's software-defined radio class would know, is that you can look up on the FCC website that ID, and you can start downloading really cool information, like a block diagram. You know, it's not a particularly sophisticated block diagram. It pretty much tells you exactly what you expect. It's got a battery, um, of course, because it can't draw a battery from the car physically or mechanically uh, be attached. Um, it reads pressure, temperature, acceleration. It has a microcontroller and a radio. Uh, so basically on each tire on every new car, you've got four of these little radio transmitters. They look kind of like this. Uh, again, no surprises. There's a battery and um, there's a chip with a little hole in it up on the, on the left side that actually senses pressure. And then I think one of the other chips is an accelerometer. There's a chip antenna there. Um, the FCC documents also contain operational descriptions of how these devices work. We already knew that, that the, you know, these things run on 315 or 433 megahertz. But um, we get more details here um, as we page through the documents about exactly how they work. It appears they only operate while you're driving or, in special cases, while the car is still, ostensibly to preserve power. Uh, the battery is only going to last so long. Um, more information, it, it sounds like they transmit on, on average maybe once a minute. They transmit very short bursts. Um, and if there's something wrong, they seem to up the transmission interval so that they can report more urgently whatever problem might be occurring on the tire. Digging further into the FCC documents, we see they use FSK modulation, very common modulation for very inexpensive wireless devices. And in another document, we find that the uh, frequency shift keying, or FSK, uh, deviation is 45 kilohertz, which is another useful piece of information. So I think it would be really interesting to receive tire pressure monitor signals and see what exactly is contained in the data that these things are transmitting. 
easiest way to do that is to get yourself uh, a software-defined radio. Uh, an RTL SDR dongle goes for about 20 bucks if you buy them on eBay or, or find a, a more reputable ven vendor. You can also use a HackRF, BladeRF, Noctar, any number of um, more expensive software-defined radios will receive these things no problem. Uh, you need an antenna. This is a really cheap little antenna that I got off of DigiKey, which works remarkably well considering it's only about this long. In fact, it's right here on the end, that guy. And lastly, I just, because I wanted to be fancy, uh, I built a little soft filter board. Uh, what this is, is it, it just filters out a very narrow portion of spectrum, keeps just the, 300, the, the signals around 315 megahertz and removes everything else. So if there's any interference from other nearby devices or FM radio stations, all that stuff goes away and does not interfere with the signals I'm trying to receive. So I take my setup, uh, RTL SDR dongle, the filter, the antenna, and I capture a really long chunk of data as I'm riding around in a car. Um, I think I spent about 20 minutes riding around and got about nine gigs worth of data. So obviously, it's going to take a little while to pick through that, uh, I devised a custom tool which um, will be made publicly, actually just was just made publicly available about half an hour ago, um, that is used to look through all of the different bursts of uh, radio transmissions that you've received in your capture file and look for salient common features between all of them. Uh, I'll actually start that guy up here. Cut and paste, cut and paste. No, 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 come on. And over to the other window, there I am. I can't even see that screen. Please work. Oh, hey, it's on this screen. It's not where I wanted it. Yeah, here it is. And, okay, this is really awkward. Well, the, the basic idea is that I can click through all the different files I've got here and I can see how they change, and I can adjust. Let's see, find a good one. No, 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 there's a good one. Uh, I can swing the frequency spectrum back and forth and line up everything on a center frequency so that I can get really good demodulated data out. I still can't see it, so hopefully I did the right thing. Um, I've got some sliders here that allow me to tune and test what the, um, bit rate of the data might be and see how if I can get a good eye diagram. Getting close there. And so with a bit of noodling around, I can identify the different parameters of a particular transmission. I can then take that data, and so for the, the data that I collected earlier that I'm going to be demoing with, um, I identified a modulation of FSK, or frequency shift keying. Uh, the carrier was at 30, uh, 53 kilohertz above the frequency I captured at, which was 314.95 megahertz, uh, the deviation in frequency around that carrier frequency was 33,000. Um, symbol rate was 20.15 kilobaud, and there was a preamble of a certain bit, bit pattern. Took all that data and typed it into this command line tool. Where's my mouse? Uh, okay. And what this does is it uh, instantiates a whole bunch of GNU radio blocks that are used to essentially de decode the raw packet, um, sp the raw spectrum data for each burst that I received into a bunch of raw bits. So these bits are ready to be processed, ready to be analyzed to figure out what sort of commonality might exist between them and what structures might exist. Uh, did it finish running? Yeah, good. So those raw bits are probably encoded with um, a technique, either um, Manchester encoding or differential Manchester encoding. The basic idea is that the, the signal needs to sort of jiggle up and down between 1 and 0 frequently in order for the clock recovery system in the radio receiver to lock in on the individual bit positions. So they use this technique in order to recover that bit clock. So I'm going to just sort of speculate that this was encoded with Manchester encoding and run this tool, which shows me across all of the packets that I received 
the distribution of the length of the packets before they became invalid Manchester streams. Basically, there are certain symbols in a, in a Manchester encoding that are invalid. And so as I decode a particular packet, if I reach an invalid symbol, I know that that must be the end of a packet. It's, it's kind of an assumption, but it works pretty well for trying to figure out what the average length of a packet might be. So if you look here, we've got a very, very strong ten, uh, trend at 70 bits. So I'm going to take 70 bits and put it back into my tool in a different mode and see what the bit st statistics are. Basically, for each bit in the packet, how many times were they a zero and how many times were they a one? And that will reveal interesting things like, no feedback. Uh, right here, we've got interesting eight bits that are statistically about 50% one and 50% zero across all of the packets that I covered. And that would suggest that there's a CRC there. You know, CRCs, statistically, if, if you use them across semi-random packet data, you're going to get semi-random CRC values. And so I'm going to hazard a guess that those are actually CRC bits there. Now, you'll recall earlier when I showed you uh, photos of the TPMS sensors that they all seem to have 32-bit identifiers on them. Uh, I've got another mode for this tool which will allow me to just test ranges of bits and see how many different values those fields contain. Did I? Ah, missed. Yeah, so what this does is it, it um, I, I used command line arguments that said, so look at bits 0 through 31 and tell me how many unique values occur across those 32 bits. And you can see there's a whole lot of them. Well, in this case, since I was riding along in my friend's car, and his car has four wheels, I would expect to see only four values if I had guessed the correct, uh, correct range of bits in the packet. Um, the statistics should wind up being just four. So I continued to iterate down all of the bits that are present in the packet, and I eventually, where's the feedback coming from here? Oh. There we go. Hey, look at that. So if we go bits 21 through 53, 21 through, yeah, 21 through 53, 32 bits in the packet, we get exactly four unique values. So I would say that those are probably the four unique identifiers on this friend's car. Continuing on, uh, I start graphing those values. Um, I, I've observed that in the, in, on these tire pressure monitors, you've got um, typically an 8-bit alignment. Like the way these things are designed, they like working in bytes. So if I start from 21 bits, where the beginning of the 32-bit identifier might be, and work back a couple of bytes, and start looking at arbitrary 8 bits or 8-bit uh, fields before that ID, uh, we might find some interesting statistics there too. Where's my mouse? And that pops up a graph on the other screen. So if you look at that, you can see there's a very limited range of values from 153 to 174. So I would say that that's some sort of a measurement uh, I can also do that on thir bits 13 through 21 and find a similar range. So let me get back to my slides here. So here's essentially what, what we've learned by examining the raw bursts. We've, we've gone through demodulation, um, converting the symbols into bits, doing some statistical analysis on the various bits, uh, and then started to break down the, what appears to be the packet structure. So here's the, the graph of uh, bits 13 through 20 and the um, CRC fields, that, uh, the, my speculated CRC field. Sure enough, there's a really good distribution if we graph it out. So let's say we want to figure out the CRC so that we can reject packets that we don't care about or that might be invalid or might be from a completely different car. There's a uh, neat little open source package that I found on GitHub called bruteforce-crc. Yeah, I gotta get rid of this blasted window. There I am. 
Boom. Oh, come on. Did that paste? Oh, that's running. Oh, yeah, you're right. Probably. Yeah. I just have to find my mouse first. There we go. All right. So um, I dumped the Manchester decoded bits into a file, and then I kept only packet data that had occurred three or more times so that it, so that I could reject packets that were probably that probably contained bit errors. If you have bit errors and you're trying to brute force a CRC, it's going to mess up the CRC guesses because the numbers aren't going to add up. Well, add up, so to speak. So I'm going to run this through brute force CRC, and it's so fast. Um, when you're brute forcing an 8-bit CRC, it does not take much effort. But um, my guess that the CRC was computed from bits 5 to 61, and that the CRC was in 61 through 69 proved to be positive, and it tells me what the polynomial was and how to initialize the CRC. I proceed then to write a, just a little chunk of Python code that goes and graphs everything out all nice with the IDs that I identified and all the stuff I learned about the different fields, and run that through here real quick. Cool. And there's the graph on the other screen again. We'll look at what we get. So um, on the top, I figured out it was pressure. What me and my friend did is we drove around for a while. The tire in, or the pressures in the tires increased because as you drive around, the tires warm up pressure increases a bit. Um, we stopped. We let three pounds of air out of one tire. It was actually the right front. Drove a little bit, let pressure out of the left front, and then the left rear. And so we can see clearly which one, which sensor is which tire. On the bottom, it's clearly temperature because there aren't any discontinuities due to pressure. And it very much behaves as you would expect for starting out on a 59 degree day, driving around for a bit, and then stopping a bunch. So uh, I was quite pleased when I got this graph. OK, and so there we are. So there are a couple challenges in demodulating or uh, receiving tire pressure monitors in general. And that is that um, they all seem to be just a little bit different. There really isn't any industry standard other than I think because of FCC and, inter and other countries' um, spectrum allocations, they all seem to wind up on 315 megahertz or 433. Some of them use amplitude shift keying. Some of the, them, actually most of them, seem to use frequency shift keying. The deviation uh, for FSK, the center frequency and bit rates, all seem to vary just a little bit. The packet structures are different. And the mechanism by which they compute the CRC or checksum varies. So what all this adds, adds up to is it's very hard to build a single software-defined radio demodulator and decoder that will do all of them. So what I think is really necessary if you want to be able to do all the tire pressure monitors that are out there is to do runtime signal characterization where you capture these bursts and then you analyze them at a much higher level and figure out what all these values are every single packet you receive. Uh, I've been working on that a little bit. I don't quite have enough to publish because it doesn't work reliably enough for people to waste their time on. Although I suppose I, if there are other people who know how to do these things or want to learn, uh, we could work on them together. Um, so what have we learned? I, I can sit at home and I can receive these tire pressure monitors from 30, 40, 50 feet away easily. The signals are very easily demodulated and decoded. Um, all you need is GNU radio and very simple software-defined radio techniques. The identifiers appear to be in the clear. Uh, a lot of the IDs that I've seen from a particular vehicle are actually in, in order. You know, they, they got sensor ID 3001, 3002, 3003, and 3004 on their car. Um, and they appear to be unique at least between 
uh, within a particular manufacturer of a sensor. It only takes about a $20 radio receiver and a laptop in order to receive these signals and process them. And if they decide they want to improve the security regime, because obviously this is not so great, they can't upgrade these devices because they're very simple little microcontrollers. There's no in the field update mechanism, nothing. And say, after saying all that, I think you know what all the implications are. We could sit around and make them up all day, but this is a 20 minute talk and, and you guys have very good imaginations. So how did the industry respond when they were called out on this about three years ago? They claimed, one of the major manufacturers claimed that these devices were nearly impossible to track, uh, it was nearly impossible to track a driver's location. And their arguments were the signals were weak and that there were 147 different protocol implementations and you couldn't possibly build 147 different receivers to receive all of them. And that it was expensive to deploy trackers because the paper that they were responding to three years ago was using fairly expensive software-defined radios and they figured, well, software-defined radios are expensive, right? Well, I think in the last year it's been proven that software-defined radios are not expensive, not hard to use, are readily available and are a big threat to devices like these. So what should we do? Um, the industry doesn't seem particularly interested in the implications of these devices. They seem to be just giving the standard arguments. So if you're interested in this subject, get uh, an RTL SDR, HackRF, or other software-defined radio. Get my code, which I put up on GitHub about an hour ago, and jump in somebody's car capture some signals, use the software to decode it, and contribute back what you've learned to the project. And here's a rep, my, actually the best reference for the entire paper, or for my entire talk, and this is a great place to read up if you want to know a lot more detail about how TPMS works and the specific privacy implications. So, any questions? No? Go ahead. Have you tried I have not. Um, this all kind of... Oh, yes. Uh, have I tried forging any of these? I would love to. Uh, one, I don't own a TPMS device or a car myself, and I don't want to destroy other people's in the event that I do do something awful. All the chances are it wouldn't be permanent. Um, but I would love to, given the right circumstances. And given what I've shown, it should be trivial. Sure, no problem. Okay, cool. <laughs> Mr. Ryan. Are any packets that I've seen variable length? I have seen none that appear to be variable length. Um, they almost, I can't think of an example where they haven't been eight bytes, plus or minus eight bits. Um, I've seen a lot of them. I've only decoded about three manufacturers worth of, of sensors, and there may be variations within a particular vehicle manufacturer, but so far, I haven't seen any variability at all. Definitely, um, but I kind of went with the statistical probability that I, I wanted to go in and look at just the data for a particular vehicle so that I could extrapolate from there what the fields might be. Um, eventually, I think this project will evolve to the point where you can just sit on a street corner and pull in any car that might be going by because we'll have enough knowledge about all of the different encodings, modulations, and all that. Mike? Uh, I can't say with authority because a lot of it's been casual, but I have been 30 or 40 feet from the street, uh, and it's a fairly slow street, 30, 30 miles an hour is probably the prevailing speed, and I've received lots of TPMS packets in that situation. And sometimes multiple packets over the course of 10 or 15 seconds. If the car was passing, you, you know, kind of consider your trigonometry and figure that there, there were some additional number of feet between one, recept one transmission and the other transmission, so certainly 30 or 40 feet, no problem. Yes. Uh, I was using this exact setup, and yeah, it was from in inside the house. <laughs> Anybody else? Go ahead. So, if I put new tires on my car, does that mean that my car can decode all of these different types, or is it that 
some cars just won't pick up the signal from some tires. It's in the step. Yeah, so, you have so they just take the step out. So if you have to adjust the car, you replace it. Right. You have to adjust the computer. For the yeah, I was actually talking to a gentleman from uh, Quebec and was talking about how there everyone has snow tires. So they don't bother getting tire pressure monitors on their cars, on their snow tires, because it's expensive. So that's actually a weakness in, or, or a way to um, kind of eliminate the whole TPMS issue is get some aftermarket rims, put them on. Kenny. You mentioned the accelerometers. Yeah, some of them have accelerometers. Um, I would assume there's probably other designs. I haven't seen any that didn't use accelerometers that use maybe th things like mer mercury switches or something to pop on a MOSFET uh, over a period of time. But, but Is the accelerometer data ever sent out in the packet? Uh, I haven't seen it myself. The, the typical packet structure I've seen is pressure, temperature, and then a flag field that's got eight bits that seem, seem to just sort of be arbitrarily assigned. I've seen some flag bits that seem to be indicating that the car was stopped for a while and maybe hadn't co accumulated enough data for its report to be entirely valid. Um, I haven't, haven't really been able to articulate those individual flag fields, partly because I don't own a vehicle where I could do extensive testing, let all the tire out of the, or all the air out of the tire, or um, run the battery down, or, or other things like that. Go ahead. You must continue to transmit for some number of minutes, like 10 minutes after the car is stopped. Is that something you read or observed, or is it very, I only really um, it, so do TPMS devices continue to report after the car stopped? And I have only really put myself in a situation where I could see cars moving. I have seen uh, FCC filings that have claimed that transmission only occurs while the car is moving. I've seen like like the one I showed you earlier that apparently it keeps going for ten minutes or so. Um, it seems to vary. Uh, the one thing to understand about TPMS is, is it seems like there's no real standard at all as far as how they behave. Do you know if these are associated at manufacturer time with the computer in the car, or do they learn if a new one shows up? Uh, as, as far as the ECU picking up? The question is, if you, if you change the wheel and you have a device with a new ID, does your engine computer figure that out and start using that? Uh, I don't think they do, but I don't know. Um, they, have to, they have to, when you put a new wheel on, the mechanic or whoever has to actually put in the motor. Yeah, I've, I know that some devices do use a, a, like a low frequency activation system where the, the dealer or the repair shop will have a device that they can use to put the device into a programming mode. There might be an opportunity. Um, and see, that puts it into a mode where they, I, I don't know whether they can change the ID. I think they can change the ID with that. There, there's also devices that are being sold that can speak almost any of the common formats. Like uh, Schrader is a company that offers a lot of different protocol support in about three different physical devices. Uh, and so these devices are clearly able to be reprogrammed somehow, um, and probably through this low frequency mechanism. Go ahead. They, they don't reprogram the IDs in it. They reprogram what's in the car's computer, right. or what ID you're looking for. Well, that's, that's the, I think, the common approach, but I think these Schrader devices, you can actually reprogram the devices themselves because they, they can be put into any number of different cars that use different protocols. So you, you can do it both ways, it seems. Some cars actually do learn the ID. They do? Yeah. Okay. So when I change wind to tires, cars learn the bus. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that makes sense. You, you wind up getting a, a statistical preponderance that, well, these IDs must be part of the vehicle. I guess the only confusing, poten or the only potential problem there is you wouldn't, if, the, if your car reports which tire has a problem, it wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you that. Oh, it does? Hmm, interesting. What kind of car do you drive? <laughs> Sorry? Okay. Hmm, interesting. Time. Well, um, thank you. Uh,